Our scripture reading this morning is Luke 16, 19 through 31. Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in a flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime doest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he's comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into the place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. We look at a series of, of descriptions that we have here concerning our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have everlasting life. He's our Redeemer. And um, and some of the terms that are used to describe him vary in Scripture. And the Redeemer, as one man wrote, is often spoken of under the emblem of a stone. In the blessing of Joseph, from thence is the shepherd the, st the, shep the stone of Israel. Then concerning what Moses had said, their rock is not as our rock, our enemies themselves being judges. And David had said, the Lord is my rock. Behold, be thou my dwelling rock. That stone is made head cornerstone which builders did despise. Isaiah said, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he shall be, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. Zechariah had said, Before one stone shall be seven eyes. Daniel said, The little stone shall become a great mountain and fill the earth. Christ 
said of himself, upon this rock I will build my church. We read also where it says, whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but upon whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Referring to the rock which Moses smote, Paul says, that rock was Christ. Again, Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up into a holy temple in the Lord. Peter said, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. These, these scriptures teach us that the Lord Jesus Christ was appointed by his Father. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone. In the arrangement for redeeming men, the Father sits as the representative of the Trinity, the work of the Trinity. The prerogative of sovereignty belongs to him. It's his prerogative to appoint commission, quality, sustain, receive, and reward. And then one man went on to write, the Son, who is God, equal with the Father, voluntary, voluntarily became his official subordinate. He became a righteous servant of Jehovah. And we see a number of descriptions uh, concerning Christ, our rock, Christ, our stone. It, it says, Wherefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, wherefore God also highly hath highly exalted him. Christ is the elect precious stone. The Father chose the Son because he was worthy. The Father, no creature, human or angelic, was qualified. No created being could bear the infinite load that was laid upon our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. No creature could bear the weight of that glory that was conferred to the Lord Jesus Christ. None but God could atone, and only God could reign. But Christ was God. In him dwelt all the plenitude of the Godhead bodily, because he was the brightness of his Father's glory and the express image of his person. He possessed, as one man wrote, he possessed unsearchable riches. He's therefore able to bear the guilt of man's sin and worthy to bear the glory of man's redemption. And then we also see beyond just the fact that he is the living stone. A second thing is that he was dishonored by men. He's still dishonored today. He's still dishonored for, for centuries by many who would desire to smite him or just bring him to death. So it may be that Moses smiting the rock was a type of the Father smiting Christ who was the substitute of his people. One man had written, when exaction was made, he submitted himself. The Father caused to fall on him the iniquity of us all. Awake, O sword, against the man that is my fellow. Smite the shepherd. He bare our sins in his own body to the tree. He who is without sin, he who is perfect, he bare our sins in his own body to the tree. He died for our sins 
that we might have everlasting life. He gave of himself for our blessing. We see further, but what we have now in view is that this divine purpose was accomplished by wicked men. He was betrayed by Judas. He was condemned to death by the Jewish Sanhedrin. He's delivered to Pilate and Herod and the soldiers to mock and scourge and crucify. And as the scripture says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain. It says further, for a truth against thy holy child, Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. Rulers of the people, elders who were a part of the nation of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, whom they, they did crucify, is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. He was exalted as a perfect Savior. The chief cornerstone binds the walls together and unites them to the foundation. Peter had said, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other the name under heaven given among men, whereby he must be saved. Paul had declared, and there's a number of places we can see these quotes, but Paul declared, ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye, ye are also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. And further, it became him for whom are all things by whom are all things, for bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of our salvation perfect through suffering. We see Jesus, as one man said, we see Jesus for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste of death for every man. So we think of that which he went through. He did that on our behalf that we might be blessed and that we would recognize how Christ truly is our rock. One man wrote, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. The sevenfold operations of the Holy Ghost are subject to Christ. In the exercise of this spirit, energy, and power, Christ went by the apostles and preached to men in prison of sin, and multitudes were converted, and we rejoice in that. By the way, we should make an effort to, to keep in mind when praying for Casey in jail, that when those men come by there, and the Gideons come by, you know, for Bible lessons, let's pray that it would pierce his heart, and that he would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We also see 
that there's a great multitude of people that are being saved. And uh, it's interesting. Uh, look at this book I told you. It was written in 1899. And, uh, and he's writing here. And think about the year where there's a vast number of people who are coming to salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's just interesting to think about that historically. When Bishop Ripon read the account of the labors of John Williams in the South Sea Islands, he said, this is the 29th chapter of the book of the Acts. Livingston was found dead in a hut in the heart of Africa, kneeling by his cot. His last recorded prayer was, all I can say in my solitude, solicitude is, may heaven's rich blessing come down on everyone, American, English, Turk, who will help to heal this open sore of the world. Once again, we make reference to the uh, article about Judith. We think about the sacrifice that she made, uh, that, sh that there would be those who would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would be hard to picture, but what, one of the things that Judith did a lot of those women just lived in the, the barest of huts and uh, nothing, certainly nothing ornate, just hardly anything to keep the wind out, really. And, uh, and so, but she's there. She's sitting out in this hut with a group of women that are there from Bala. She's sharing the gospel with them. And they come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saved. There were a lot of people saved under her ministry and ministries that she helped with there in Africa. And we're thankful. But as it says here, Livingstone was found dead in a hut in the heart of Africa, kneeling by his cot. His last recorded prayer was, All I can say and my solicitude is, may heaven's rich blessing come down on everyone, American, English, Turk, who will help heal this open sore of the world. The first martyrs in Uganda, Central Africa, were three young men. Their savage chief said, oh, you believe Jesus will raise you from the dead. Well, we'll burn you and see. A great fire was started. Two of them were slain, their bodies mutilated and thrown into the fire and burned. As they approached the third, he said, Oh, do not cut off my arms. I will not fight or struggle. Only throw me into the fire. They added another soul. Others that we see from a historical standpoint one was Francis Xavier stood before China and this was before the communists were there and a lot of problems anyway but when Francis Xavier stood before China and recognized the vastness of the empire and the iron mold in which they were held and the granite prejudices by which they were bound he cried oh rock Rock, when wilt thou be open to the master? But God smote the rock, floods gushed, and ran in the desert like a stream. And Morrison, Happer, and Hudson Taylor, whose cry, a million a month in China, die without God. Hedonira Johnson had an offer of an inviting pastorate in Boston, but he chose to suffer affliction in Burma. 
another chapter in God's work of providence. His friends wrote, what are the prospects? It was about 10 years after he started there, and there was only a, f a few prospects. But anyway, some people that he knew had contacted him and, and asked, how many are prospects? He answered, there are 30,000 converts with Judson's Burmese Bible in their hands. This is the 32nd chapter of the Acts. In 1833, Commodore Perry entered Japan. He opened his little, excuse me, he opened, <clears throat> he ordered his port uh, to be open. He entered all, without firing a shot. Japan adopted the Christian calendar in 1874. Japan adopted the Christian Sabbath, and in 1890, she adopted a constitutional government. And today, when this book was written, 1899, today there are three native synods representing native churches, and they send out missionaries to the farm field. The story of Madagascar is of thrilling interest. There's, there's more in great detail, but just think about, about their work. I think reading missionary stories is pretty neat. And uh, I might mention, one of the men who had been in the field in, in Africa was a dentist, wasn't he? It's dead. And uh, there was someone there who uh, had some health thing. And so this man who's the, who had been a dentist was the only one with any sort of medical background at all. So he got a book on medicine and looked it up what he needed to do and he did it and the person got better and got well and praise the Lord praise the Lord there are so many stories to look at here one statement the missionaries landed in 1821 on an island 1,000 miles long 350 miles wide and having six million people. Little was accomplished at first. In 1837, a new king ordered the mission houses confiscated, the missionaries in prison, and the converts scattered. This reign of terror continued till 1861, when the king died and his sister came to the throne and she knew Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. She had come to salvation. These stories, as we think of Christ the King, Christ our rock, Christ the way of salvation, we rejoice in it. May we give all the glory to God. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we pray that you would bless us in a mighty way. And uh, we pray that these stories about missionaries, that there would still be places where they are on fire for the Lord and where many would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.